thanks so much for being here and coming up, and we'd love to hear your story. So, welcome. team both well for me it was two years ago Melissa was on last year as well for three years I was just yeah. for one year um, and we both took this class two years ago mm -hmm. um, and yeah it actually had a really big impact on both of us um, so yeah we're gonna yeah talk a little bit about that um, we both are on the 60 um, in track and field I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with track and field um, I, I can explain because everybody's <laughs> from different yeah. sports yeah. okay so yeah. 60 is about seven and a half seconds so That's it. <laughs> so that's what we train for. <laughs> five days a week for how many days? For how many years? <laughs> yeah. How many hours? Seven and a half seconds. Yeah. So it's about like 600 hours a year of training for a hopefully seven and a half seconds. If it's not so good, maybe it's eight. <laughs> and the difference between um, making a finals or making um, nationals can be the difference of a hundredth of a second. So it's a crazy sport in some ways. <laughs> yeah, lots and lots of hours and lots and lots of work. And yeah, so it's not just about running and running fast. It's all about like what you do in practice too. And there's like little things you have to work on, like your form. You have to work on like lifting lots of weights because apparently you need to work on every muscle in your body. Um, yeah, so it's lots and lots of work. And it's not only lots of physical work, but it's also a lot of mental work because something that people don't realize a lot is how much of a mental sport track is and if you aren't on your mental game you aren't on your physical game either because yeah it's just not gonna work out mental for you. game can be about two tenths so that's the difference yeah. between first in the country or 30th in the country <laughs> so there's a lot of different aspects to it so it's hard because you're training your nervous system in a lot of ways to essentially respond to a gun without having to think about it so it's a unique sport. There's not much brains involved in it. <laughs> it's best if you shut off your brain yeah. but <laughs> and just get it done. But yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of what we did. Um, and yeah, so I'm kind of just going to share my story about um, my track experience at the U of A, and Melissa will share hers as well. Um, I guess it's kind of more than just at the U of A. But um, so basically, I started doing sport very young like most people. I was like in little kid soccer and I always grew up playing sports. I loved it a lot. Um, and from a very young age, people realized that I was really fast and I got the nickname Speedy Gonzalez on all my soccer teams. It was really lame, but it happened. Um, so um, as I got into like high school, people started to actually, like people that mattered, actually started to realize that I was fast. And when I was in grade 10, um, a man by the name of Rob Fisher, he was my coach. He found me and he basically begged me to come and try out track with him on with his track club. And so I went out and I was like, okay, what is this track thing all about? Is it more than just like running? Um, so yeah, so I started to do that and gradually as I became better and better, I started to love it more. And when, after my grade 10 year, I decided to quit soccer and just focus on track because I realized that that's kind of what I was better at. Um, so yeah, I started to love it more, I started to be more committed, um, and just as gradually as that happened, I eventually started to really resent it. And um, as I got into like my 12th year in high school, I would come up with stupid excuses not to go to track because there was something of like a disconnect there between my brain and my physical abilities and um, Okay, it was like little excuses like, oh, my tummy kind of hurts. I shouldn't go to practice. Oh, I kind of have a headache. I shouldn't go to practice. Oh, I kind of, my shins kind of hurt. Maybe I shouldn't go to practice. And so I did that a lot. Um, and now, like, looking back, I realized that probably part of the biggest reason why I did that, I think, was because um, track for me at that time was something that was so focused on myself. And... Um, yeah, it wasn't something that I like. I hadn't ever thought about incorporating my faith, which was such an important part of my life, but I never thought of incorporating it into my sport. And it was just like something so separate. And so for me, it was there was just a disconnect there, and I couldn't feel the passion for track that I did for God or for my faith. Um, 
So yeah, when it came time for me to graduate, I realized that I had two choices. Um, the first was to go on this thing called a discipleship training school with an organization called Youth with a Mission, um, or YWAM. And that's basically, it's like a six month or a five month thing, and it's three months of a lecture phase, and you basically just like learn more about God and uh, the love of God and who He is. Um, and then the next two months is an outreach portion where you do practical work and spread the love of God. Um, so I was thinking about doing that or Bible college um, or my other option was to go to U of A on a Czech scholarship. And I think that in the end, um, there's a lot of pressure on me and I felt I had a lot of pressure that I put on myself to perform and to do well in this sport. And I think also like greed and longing for personal glory um, got the best of me. Um, but I don't know, I guess in, in the end it was kind of cool because um, even if the path we choose isn't the one that God intends for us, um, He still makes it work together for His glory and, and our good. Um, and that kind of brings it along to the rest of my journey. So, um, university brought more and a lot tougher uh, work in track and training. Um, I had to push myself a lot more than I ever had before in my life and I actually had to commit more than I ever had in my life and it was really, really, really hard. Um, uh, I had to push myself both physically and mentally because, like I said, track is such a mental sport and if you don't, if you don't have your mind engaged, you're not going to be able to perform physically the way that you feel like you should. Um, and for me, it was like there was, again, there was that disconnect between between my faith and between my, the sport that I loved so much, and and it kind of inhibited me from being able to to perform it to the best of my abilities. Um, yeah, in my so the first semester was a little bit rough, and I was really struggling with like with what it was that I was doing with track because I I couldn't I couldn't understand how to wrap my my brain around it because I was like I don't understand how to engage myself spiritually and mentally. Um, so in my second semester, I took this class with Melissa, um, and it was an evening class, so it was like three hours long instead of just 50 minutes. Um, but it actually had a huge impact on me, and it made me realize that there was something more missing from my sport. Um, uh, we talked about a lot um, the idea of play in sport, and how that's missing a lot of the time in sport, because um, play is... Or sport is something that you should play, right? And playing is supposed to be fun. Um, and I realized that track is one of the only sports that you don't play. Track is something you do track. You don't play track, you do it. Um, and and they thought that that was wrong because I realized like I was not having any fun at all in track and I wasn't enjoying it at all and I was just doing it. Um, and so it really got me thinking about what was missing and I realized more and more that what was missing was God and um, I needed I needed to incorporate him into my sport and I'd never thought about combining the two before I was like okay here's my faith life and here's everything that I do for God and here's track okay and that's separate but um, I realized with God prompting me that I needed to make the choice to bring him into my sport and um, and I needed God's help to um, like give him the glory for this gift that he's given me because I couldn't run fast on my ability. It's not like I woke up one morning and was like, mm, I'm going to run fast today. No, it was something that was built into me. It was something that God gave me the gift to do. And it only makes sense that I give him the glory for that. Um, and so I prayed a lot and I was like, God, I need to surrender everything that I am to you. Um, like, I need... I need you to be into this sport. I need you to be, um, yeah, I need, I need to incorporate you into this, and I need you to be the most important thing for me in this. Um, and so gradually, it just, it made me realize that the most important thing wasn't the rankings, and, because in track, basically, you're a number, and if you do, if you do well, you're a really good number. So like, like we said, for a 60 meter, seven and a half seconds, that's really good. Um, and something that for me that I've struggled with my whole life is, and I know a lot of people have, is um, like comparing yourself to other people and um, always wanting the approval of other people. And 
and in track, that's kind of the most important thing, you know? And like, so for me, it was like, I focused a lot on the rankings and the times and pleasing people. And it wasn't until I didn't focus on those things and I didn't focus on doing well. I did that to God. I just said, God, I don't want to care about these things anymore. And it was amazing because as soon as I gave those up to him, unexpectedly, he gave them right back to me. Um, in my first year, my only year, I guess, um, I went to CanWest Championships in Saskatchewan and I got first at in the 60 meter there. Um, and then a few weeks later, I went to the CIS National Championship and I got second in the 60 meter and they set a school record, um, also earning me the title of Rookie of the Year for all of the U of A athletics. And um, honestly, there is absolutely no possible way that I should have been able to do that. I went into the season with like a 778 time and I went out of the season with a 751 time. That's ridiculous. For a 60 meter, there is no way that I should have ever been able to do that. Honestly, it was all the glory of God. He, there's no way I could have done it without him. And, um, but the cool thing is that all of those cool things that I did, um, although they seem to matter to other people, but like now it's like they don't, it, it carries no weight. And I, those things don't even matter to me in comparison to the way that I learned how to surrender to God in my sport and I learned how to, what it meant to run with God and run for the glory of God and that was more fulfillment than I could have ever gained from any title or any record or any time and it was so much more satisfying. So that's kind of my story about how I was able to bring sport into track. Um, but uh, no. Um, but I just want to say, like, kind of a disclaimer, like, just because I surrendered my sport to, to God doesn't and, and then did well, that's not saying that that's like, God isn't going to be the answer to you doing well in your sport. Um, surrender looks different to every person, and, um, and ultimately God always wants to work on your heart first before he ever wants, before he wants to work on anything else. And for me, that's the way he worked on my heart. But as you can see, it worked differently for Melissa. Her surrender looked completely different than mine did, and her outcome looked completely different than mine did. It's the same way with any of yours would look very different. So it's not saying that God is going to make you amazing. I mean, he has made you amazing, but he's not going to make you like be the best at your sport necessarily. It's going to be different for every person. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm going to share about the same season. I did three years at the University of Alberta here, three years on the track team. Um, and in the, this was my second year that when Katrina was on the team. And then um, the four of us, actually, Daniela, Danica, Katrina, and I, we were all training partners. So they know a good chunk of our story, too. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm going to share about that 2013 season, um, because that was kind of the game changer season for me in a lot of ways. And that was the year that we took this class. Um, and there was a lot of other things going on in my life that made that season the game changer season. Um, one of it was I came into that season with really, really high expectations for myself. Um, and I think a big part of that was the fact that I missed nationals um, the year before because I tore my hamstring in the conference championships. And um, so the conference championships is essentially um, Western Canada. And then after that, you go on to nationals, all of Canada. And um, I missed nationals because I tore my hamstring in the relay <laughs> at conference championships. And my plane ticket was already booked before then to go to nationals. And just like that, it was like one minute I was going, next minute I was grabbing up my hamstring. <laughs> and my coach pulled me off the track and it was gone. And it was really hard because I was kind of like, why God? Like, why would you let me, like, why would you let this happen to me? Like, I trusted in you, I believe in you. And like, you knew how much this meant to me. Like. I really wanted to go to nationals. I, like, it meant a lot to me because I felt like it kind of proved that I was somebody on the team and somebody, you know, in a field of 80 people that, oh, Lissa actually contributes to this team. She's actually like significant on this team. And all of a sudden, I wasn't going anymore. So that was really hard. And I thought for a moment, I was like, well, maybe God will heal me. Maybe if I pray and believe, God will heal me. And then I get to go to nationals and everybody gets to see how big and awesome and powerful my God is. Didn't happen. <laughs> Two weeks later, um, the group that was going to nationals that year 
was getting their team gear, and I was rehabbing on a bike. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it was hard. It was hard to see them go. There was another guy that injured his hamstring, but um, he had qualified in an individual event. Um, he went anyways, although he couldn't jump very well, but he went. Um, so that made it even a little bit harder, because I'm like, okay, we have the same injury. I get why I'm not going. On a relay team, Melissa doesn't need to go. It's four people from the U of A that get to go. The four fastest people. With a broken hamstring, I'm not <laughs> one of those four people. Um, so yeah, I was a little bit upset, upset about that, but that experience, I kept on having to go to God with all my pain, because it was the only thing that made sense. Um, yeah, I, did, like, I didn't understand why. I still don't necessarily understand why, but in the midst of it, I kept on going to God. I just had to like, be like, you know what, God? I'm like, okay. <laughs> it was the only way I found peace about it, and I just believed that. I'm like, okay, God will use this for his good somehow, and for my good somehow. Um, but I think that was a big reason why I had a lot of pressure that I put on myself the second, the second season, because I'm like, I can't make it back. I was there. <laughs> I was this close. <laughs> and... Um, Second year, we ended up getting a new director in, so there was a lot of changes to the team. It was a high performance focus, so we went from like an 80 person team down to 40, because all of a sudden we wanted quality over quantity, and um, there was a lot new, there was not a lot, lot of new opportunities with that. Um, we had the opportunity to travel to the States, um, and of course across Canada, um, but going farther away, there was one meet that was down in Arizona. I think <laughs> making a meet like that because it costs that much more to send somebody means you have to be that much better. So all these things, instead of being like, man, this is awesome, translated to, oh crap, <laughs> I need to perform. I need to step up the bar. And like, also being on a smaller team where everybody was somebody that would go to Can West, everybody was that kind of material, meant going to Can West, going to the conference championships, wasn't really that big of a deal anymore. So you're like, okay. And a high performance like environment also meant like to be above the average, to be recognized on this team as somebody, meant like you need to pull off something way bigger <laughs> than what you had to pull off when there was 80. Um, so yeah, I was kind of freaked out a little bit about it, and there was a lot of fast people on the team, and I knew um, in the 60, in my second year, I w it wasn't in the cards for me to be able to qualify for nationals. I wasn't. I knew I wasn't going to be able to quite run that time, so it had to be in the relay. Um, and there was seven of us girls that ended up trying for four spots. <laughs> um, so it was pretty hard. But anyways, I buried myself kind of into training, got really involved with, um, I guess, focusing on what I needed to do. And um, I went and saw sport performance because I didn't want another hamstring to go. <laughs> and I did massage every other week, and I started taking supplements and stuff like that. And um, all out of my own pocket, so I started pouring more of myself into it, including finances, um, to be ready come January, and then before you know it, January comes, and you're like, okay, I got a race. <laughs> so first race of the season, I was ready to go, and um, the previous two years that I had done track, I did a year of club um, before I did U of A track. I had PB'd in my first race, so a PB is the personal best. I'd run the fastest race that I had ever run up until that point in my life in the first race of the last two previous seasons. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this again. Let's start this off, let's get this year going. And I was so ready to go, I was in the blocks and you kind of like shake out and like, I was so ready to go that I was almost tense. And like, you could feel it even in my breath that you're like, so anticipation and so much just like desire to do well. And um, I did run that race with all my strength, but unfortunately 60s are not about how strong you are, <laughs> they're about how fast you are. And um, Another thing with running is like for me, um, I, I, I do play more on the strength side of the 60 and the power side of it, but if I'm too tense and trying to be too strong in the race, I'll shorten my stride. So that means that I need to take maybe two or three extra steps in a 60 versus somebody else that gets to open up. And so I ran a horrible time because <laughs> I tried too hard essentially, uh, very backwards in some ways. <laughs> Um, and the relay did not go very well that day for me either. So I was like, okay, next meet. So the next weekend we did it all again, and I'd like to say it went better, it went worse. <laughs> went way worse, and I was a total head case about it. Um, so again, I was like, okay, Melissa, you know you can do this, let's shake it off, let's do better, next meet, next meet, next meet. 
Um, unfortunately, I wasn't going to the next meet. <laughs> um, the next meet was a travel meet. It was in Winnipeg. And um, after that second performance, the travel roster came out and it was kind of, you know that moment when your stomach just drops and your mouth goes dry and you're like, start to go into a panic and your eyes go really wide and you're like reading who's all going and you're like, my name's not on there. And you're like, okay, I have to read it again. No, my name's actually not on here, what on earth? And then you're like, start to get mad and you're like, I deserve to go. I went last year, I'm like, I, I've proven all these different things throughout my track career. Sure, it didn't happen in the last two weeks, but it would happen at the right time. I knew it would. I knew I was capable of it. And then I went to talk to our head coach and I was like, I need to know why he's not sending me. Like, what on earth is up? So I went and talked to him and um, it kind of became, became clear to me that it was based on those last two races, which was legit. He didn't really take into account my whole career and the fact of what I was even doing in practice on a daily basis. Um, which was fair though, like I, it was a completely fair decision, but it was still disheartening. And it was even more disheartening because I knew to make it to nationals that year, I had to be on a relay team, and they ran two relay teams at that meet, and I wasn't on either of them. <laughs> and um, yeah, that was really hard, because all of a sudden it was like, yep, you're not even worth bringing along, we're not even considering you anymore. Um, like I said, there was seven girls trying out for four spots, two were obvious, um, so that left four of us for two spots, and I wasn't one of those four anymore. And I asked my coach, I'm like, okay, well, how can I be back into this four? Um, how can I be a player? And he's like, we'll keep an eye on you in practice, but I knew what that meant. That didn't really mean much. Um, so that was really hard. And like, kind of walked away from that, just feeling like a complete and utter failure. Like, man, I didn't make my goal, and my self-talk during that time was super bad. Um, there was other things in my life that were going well, even athletically, um, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but I chose to focus in on the bad and be like, Mel, you failed. Like, complete, like, you should be embarrassed. And I got to the place where I was embarrassed. I skipped practice for a couple days. <laughs> I couldn't walk into the team room. <laughs> I didn't think I was gonna cry. <laughs> Just like, felt like I had no place on the team. I wasn't a contributor anymore, and yeah, bottom line, it felt like a failure. I couldn't do this anymore, and um, yeah, I hit rock bottom. It was kind of like that straw that broke the camel's back of the slap in the face that said you couldn't do it anymore, and um, it wasn't just track. There was a lot of other things. Um, I'm a little bit of an overachiever, <laughs> or a lot of an overachiever, <laughs> and so like um, that was winter semester, and that was the hardest um, school year of my life, just with the courses I was taking, and to boot I had taken spring and summer classes the previous year, so by the time, my goodness, the winter semester ended, I had 20 months of school done, <laughs> but I had hit already October that year, and I was done with school, I was so stressed out, oh Kem is not your friend, um, <laughs> but yeah, so there's so many different things, I was just like, my marks weren't where I wanted them to be, um, my goodness, track was not where I wanted it to be. And these were two things that I kind of had really high expectations for myself in, and I wasn't meeting them. And um, finally got to this place where like, I couldn't really function anymore. Like, if I'm skipping practice, that means a lot. <laughs> and like, I was crying all the time and stuff, and I just kind of hit this like rock bottom place. And I realized um, I couldn't go all the time. I was constantly going. If anything was like off by 10 minutes, I was late for the next thing. That's how busy I was. And you should see my planner, it was disgusting. <laughs> It was so scribbled full. Um, but yeah, I kind of came to this realization that I'm like, I can't go all the time. I can't do everything. I can't always be productive. And I actually realized I had a fear of being unproductive. I had a fear of like sitting still and relaxing, which is <laughs> kind of really scary. And um, I realized in that moment more than anything that I'm like, I actually do need to take a break. I need to rest. I need to allow myself to like unwind and relax and just chill out. And um, a lot of that had to do with um, my relationship with God. There for years, like, just reading through my Bible, um, I was always fascinated with, like, um, whenever it talks about Sabbath in the Old Testament, or even, like, in the New Testament, where Jesus is like, come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest, and stuff like, Moses spent 40 days on a mountain. I'm like, that's like a lifetime. You know how many things you would miss in 40 days? And things like that just blew my mind. I'm like, 
I don't know how you did that. I'm like, it was a different culture. And I'm like, but no, like, <laughs> we're still people at like the core, right? So if he could do it then, like, I could take 40 days and not die because I missed so many different things, essentially. But I had a fear of missing out and a fear of being unproductive. And um, I realized at that time that I had to let go of this like white knuckle grip on everything I wanted to do. And like I thought by holding it so tight that I was protecting it, but all I did, I destroyed it essentially. Like same thing like if you hold a flower in your fist, right? And you're like, it's mine. <laughs> you open it up and there's nothing left. And that's exactly where I was at in that point in time. And after that, it was, it was really hard, but after that, um, letting go and just being like, okay, I can't do this, God. Like, I need you to help me in this. Um, and that was, yeah, January. My season began to turn around a little bit. Um, not by leaps and bounds, by hundreds of a second. <laughs> um, but it was still really hard because at the end of the day, like, being so performance driven and so, like, achievement and, like, goal orientated, I was still like, no, I still want to do good. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to die if I do bad, but, like, I still really, really, really want to do good. And um, I struggled with like, okay, I'm like, how do I strive to be excellent in something, but still not be consumed by doing well in it? And so like, that was something I struggled with the whole season. And um, a good example would even be at the conference championships that year. Um, I finally ran my personal best of the season. And you think I'd be happy, because that's a big achievement. I was mad, because <laughs> I missed the finals by that hundredth of a second, and there was a clear line between who um, should have been in the finals and who shouldn't have been, and between, I think it was fifth and I was ninth, there was eight people that get turned in the final, I think there was five, five one hundredths of a second that separated us, and after me there was about a tenth, so it was, it was, there was an obvious clear cut, and I was like, but just because there's not nine lanes, I don't get to run, <laughs> so as much as I tried to be happy about my personal best, at the same time I was super mad. And that kind of just showed me still that I'm like, okay, I still have more of this to work through. And um, one day, there was one more meet after that, it didn't really mean anything. Um, people who are running in nationals don't even run it. <laughs> um, but I was preparing for that and Katrina was preparing for um, nationals and one day her shins were super bad and she came to me and she's like, really upset about it and um, she's like, but Mel, if I don't train today, other people are getting better. Well, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> and like, out of the blue, this was something that like, I said to her that, you know those moments where like, you say something and you're like, whoa, that wasn't even me, that was like way wiser than anything um, I could have said. I said to her, I quoted one of the scriptures um, that says, why gain the whole world and yet lose your soul? And that hit me like a ton of bricks. It was something that I said as much to her as I said to me. And um, I realized that all my striving and everything I was trying to do and get done and how busy I was to gain everything, it was all for naught. Like, it was kind of, it was in vain. And like Katrina said, she's like, yeah, that year that she broke the record, like, everybody, like, celebrated her and it was awesome. There's, I know there's a ton of rookies on the year this year, like, on the team this year, they don't even know who Katrina Martin is. And it's crazy because I got so consumed with these temporary achievements that I was like driven to achieve and I forgot about like the long term and I forgot about myself and I forgot about my soul. And I realized that like I had been approached by a couple of different sports that year and um, got to this point where I was actually on the phone with my mom and I was like, mom, I think I finally get it. Like even if I won an Olympic gold medal, I, it still wouldn't be enough with where I'm at right now. It still wouldn't be enough. Because good would never be good enough because there's always better. And that's my mindset at that point in time. And so I realized that I really needed to change something. And I realized that I couldn't learn how to achieve in track and do well in track and invest in myself and my soul while doing them at the same time. So I realized that that year I'm like, okay, God's being very clear, I need to take outdoor season off. <laughs> and that was the hardest thing to tell my coach ever. Um, it shouldn't be a big deal, but there's little things, even the fact that like we had switched to an outdoor focus um, in the track 
um, like to get on the team, they used outdoor standards instead of indoor standards. So all of a sudden, this team that I was on for two years, I would be on probation and trying out for this team I was a part of all over again. Um, so even just little things like that, and I got to this point where like I lost sleep over this decision, and I couldn't eat right because I was like battling back and forth between I'm like, man, I need to take time off, but I don't want to take time off, and I just tried to compromise, and I was like, okay, God, what if I take track off and I do rugby this? Um, <laughs> summer instead, <laughs> and it was kind of like, at the same time, that feeling in the pit of your stomach where you're like, that's not the answer. <laughs> um, so the night before the last race, or the last meet of the season, I came up to my coach and I was like, you know what, Rob, um, this is the same coach, um, and I was like, you know what, Rob, I have to take outdoor season off, I can't do it, and it was crazy because as soon as I said that to him, it was just like, oh, all at once, it was just like, Finally, I can breathe again. And so, um, the next day was the 60 meter race, and I was overtired, I hadn't been sleeping right, I hadn't been eating right, I was sick because I was doing all those things. And <laughs> I had been crying for days, so I was emotionally and mentally out of it. Um, but for the first time in a long time, I lined up at the line with like complete and utter peace and just joy. And um, I remember running that race and just like coming up after 30 meters and um, to an upright running position and there was no one even around me and then I passed the line and I was like, I just won that race. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. And I remember um, running up to these girls after and just like laughing and crying with them and just being so happy and being like, oh my goodness, like it was literally like all glory to God and it just was crazy because like I didn't care what the time was and um, even in that, I ran a 10th PB. So that's enough to put me from 30th in the country to 17th in the country in one race. And, um, okay, at the, what I posted on Facebook that night, because that kind of summarizes the meet well, was, wow, huge, huge personal best today. Last week I got acquainted with the 780s, running a 789, and today I ran the personal best of a lifetime, winning the provincial championships with a 779. As cliche as this may or may not sound, all glory to God. I could not have run that without him. He gave me the freedom, peace, and joy to run that race. And that freedom made all the difference. People even noticed and commented on how relaxed I looked when I ran. Um, it was about the change on the inside. And today wasn't about me performing well. I gave my race to God. And running it was about having fun <laughs> for a change. <laughs> and however the 200 goes tomorrow, I'm happy with my season and feel very blessed. I am thankful for the process that God has taken me through, a very hard and humbling process of surrender and dependence so that I can finally have fun running fast. So, that was that year for me. <laughs> a whirlwind of a little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so kind of going back a bit um, about where I am now. Um, so after my, my indoor season, I jumped like straight into outdoor um, without a proper break, both physically and mentally and spiritually. Um, and so I started competing and training right away. Um, and throughout the season, I had developed really, really bad shin splints. Um, I don't know if you know anything about shin splints, but they, it's like one of the worst pains ever. And it's like every step I took, I was like crying because it hurt so bad. Um, um, but more than that, that was more scary, I started to compare myself to what I had achieved during my indoor season and I started to um, be thinking that I needed to live up to what I did and need to prove to other people like, oh no, I'm still that good, I'm still that person. And so I started focusing, shifting my focus again, instead of to God, I shifted it away from God and onto myself and I started being like, oh, I need to break 12 seconds in the 100 meter and I need to make this team and I need to impress these people and I need to do this and I need to do this and I need to do this. Um, and I was not focusing on God and evidently as I started to, as the pain, pain in my shin started to get worse, I also started to perform worse because I was focusing on myself and my own abilities. Um, when all of the career all came from God. Um, it took me about halfway through the season, but eventually I um, cried out to God and I was like, God, what's going on? What are you wanting me to do here? And um, I began to realize that 
he was calling me out of the sport that I had spent so much of my time investing in. Um, and he was calling me, and I felt really called to do um, that thing I was talking about earlier, a discipleship training school or a DTS. Um, and um, evidently, it took me until the very last race of my season and the very last race of my track career um, to remember what it felt like in my indoor season and remember what it felt like in general to surrender to God and to, to give up to Him what was rightfully Him and give Him the glory. In my, but in my last race, it was the most free I ever felt because I was like, God, I don't care about the times. I don't care about the results. I care about you and I care about running this race with you and with the abilities that you have given me and I want to give you the glory for all of it. Um, and and he reminded me what that was like. Um, so, yeah, so now I've come back from that DTS. I was in Australia and I was in Mongolia and China. Um, and I learned so much. Um, but it's still, for me, it's still like an everyday struggle, not struggle, but challenge to to surrender everything I am, not just my, not just sports, because I still play, like I'm going to be playing on a rec women's soccer league, like, <laughs> but the thing that has happened is God has taught me what it is really like to, to enjoy playing sports again, um, and just, just rest in the abilities that he has given me, and, and give him the glory for that, um, but it still means surrendering everything that I am to him every single day. Um, whether it's my sport or whether it's my dreams, because I want to go into full-time missions in Bolivia. Like, super random, but that's what God told me to do, but it's still, I know that that's what I want to do, and I know that that's where God's telling me to go, but it's still a matter of, okay, God, that's years away, and I need to surrender that to you now, and focus on today, and surrender today to you. Yeah. I think, like, the biggest thing about both our stories, like, they're different, um, and surrender was the theme, I guess, between both of them. And like from them we found a lot of freedom and joy, but like the bottom line is like first and foremost we were Christians that did athletic things. <laughs> and so um, athletics was just another part of our lives where we tried to integrate our faith, where we tried to integrate our salvation into our daily living. And um, for me, I'm still doing sport. Um, and last year on the track team was a lot about restoration and like God's like there was a there was a lot of hurt from what happened through that humbling process. And um, he put a lot of band-aids and salve on like all the things that had hurt me so much through um, that process in what last season was. And um, then he called me away from track and I'm now down in Calgary training for the national bobsled team. And um, it's really cool because this is a place where um, I feel more than anything that like it's just another place where God is asking me to learn more about who he is, to mo learn more about his love and knowledge of him. And it's another place where he wants to work in me and through me to be his hands and feet. And I think one of the greatest things that I've learned through that process and through the healing that came in the season after that process was just, I'm finally in that place where like, I get to enjoy sport. Um, I really resented it for a point in time just because I wasn't performing how I wanted to perform. But now it's just like I get that, free, that freedom to enjoy it and to use it as a way to praise God. So um, we want to open up the floor to you guys though. If you guys have any questions for either of us about anything we said or didn't say. Um, yeah. Just about what you said last time. You find it more fun in sport now? Mm-hmm. You kind of surrendered. I guess a lot of the pressures and the numbers. But it's different now because you're in a... Yeah. You're kind of more closer to a professional athlete now because you don't do varsity athletics. Yeah. The only difference is I don't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> so right. I'm full. I'm training full time with no salary. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's different, but it's a it's a lot of the same stuff, and it's really cool because now I can look back at this milestone and be like, you know what, God did it then. Okay, I can trust him to pull through for me again, and I can look at that process and see how much pain I had when I tried to hold on to everything on my own, and be like, you know what, I really don't want to be there again. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it's really different. There's a lot of different things that I need to surrender, because now there's, a, there's like, as much as you like, 
realizing, especially in varsity, came to this place where I realized I'm like, I'm not, I'm more than my sport, I'm not just an athlete. Yeah. But now it's like, literally, all I do is being an athlete. Like, <laughs> I'm an athlete and I go home and cook and eat and clean and whatever. You know, like that is now what I am and what I do. And it's the, the pressure to perform is a lot higher because it's like, if I'm sent home, well, then I'm like, okay, now I need to need to find a job or like <laughs> all these different things. But it's a lot of the same fundamental things of just like daily, just being like, okay, I need to still surrender this. And I think that daily choice to be like, yeah, God, I want to thank you for this gift and I want to give it back to you is how I find the enjoyment for it. Yeah. I've got lots of questions, but it's in Yeah. Um, did you find, like, both of you kind of talked about the consuming desire, like, to do your best, you especially to do better than you've ever done, and even if you want that gold medal, you still want to do better. Did you find that in, like, practicing with your teammates that all of you kind of were at some point, like, caught up in that? Like, did you, or did you find that more just, like, an individual challenge? Does that make sense? I think as a group, we pushed each other to do better. And so I think, um, I don't know, in the back of your mind, like, I, w I would not let her beat me with 30 meters because that's my start. Um, that's kind of the strong part of my race. So, like, yeah, even in practice, there was little things. It wasn't always about, like, the long-term, like, all-consuming, like, I need to do better. But there was things that you're like, if she beat me in the 30, I was, like, kind of like a dog between the tail between his legs. Like, oh, my goodness, I need to go do this better next time. <laughs> But I feel like everybody has that, like, you know, that desire to impress other people or to, like, you know, that's, like, that's why we dress up and look good, you know? Like, I mean, yeah, for sure, it's, like, to make yourself look good, but, like, yeah. a lot of the time it's, like, oh, I gotta impress other people, I gotta let them know that, like, I'm good enough, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same thing with track, but I think yeah. that the biggest thing for both of us, and especially, like, for me, I know, was yeah, yeah. that when I did surrender those things to God, it was the same thing, like, you know, I wasn't holding on to it so tight anymore, and it was the most relief that I had ever felt in my entire life, and I felt so happy and so joyful, mm -hmm. and I was able to run with joy more than I ever had in my entire life, because I wa it wasn't it wasn't about me anymore. Yeah. And I don't know what it is, but there's something so beautiful about that and, mm -hmm. and something so freeing about it. Yeah. So. And I think too, like there's a lot of things like Katrina was saying that underline that drive to succeed. Yeah. Me, I'm just a straight up type A person. So <laughs> that's a big part of it. Um, but like I, I lost sight of even why I was striving to achieve so much because I was like so busy achieving it. Um, but the reasons why I was like little things even just like you know like when you're little you're like you get praised when you do well right you get affirmed when you do well it's like there's like an underlying message of like man good job you mean something today like <laughs> so you know you just want to go out and get that feeling that even if it's a sense of accomplishment or a sense of like man I mean something to people or like honor yeah. I think that was a lot of the underlying things of like where that came from did that answer your question, kind of? Yeah. Yeah. And I think okay. it's interesting, like obviously I've never been a varsity sport, but how these different levels, like regardless of what you've achieved previously, you need that extra mm -hmm. affirmation at the next level to feel yes. like worthy of. Yeah. And because and that, sport always pushes you to do better, right? So automatically you're like, you hit one level, so your mindset is like, okay, the next goal is this, and there is always something to work towards, and so it's easy to get caught up in that. And I think that's ultimately the thing with like pleasing the world is that you're never going to be good enough. Yeah. But the cool thing was when I, when I did learn to surrender to God, it was like, yeah. okay, I am good enough because I am his child and he, is, he has made me this way. So, yeah. It is 10-2. It is 10-2. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we can stick around if people want to talk to us, but... That's great. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. yeah. So I just want to say a, a word because I, I think what the conversation's ending is just that I, I think about is what do we do then in youth sports and all that mm -hmm. to support people to strive for excellence, to, to be their best like you're striving for, but at the same time not lose our soul. Right? Like that's, yeah. Yeah, how, do, how do we balance that? And that's a real, I think that's a real struggle that people yeah. to go yeah. through. Thanks so much for offering your time, for coming in. Wonderful. Uh, thanks for sharing your stories. You're welcome. Yeah.
So we can take a couple more questions. I know people have classes at 11, so if you need to go, you're free to go. But if you'd like to stick around. Yeah.